This is our solar system. We have found out so much about it, yet this solar system has so many secrets deep inside it yet to be discovered. Our solar system consists of the Sun and the planets that revolve on its own axes and also move around the Sun. Earth is the only planet in our solar system that has life and is inhabited by living organisms of various kinds. This planet Earth is our world of which we human beings are also a part. We share our world along with other living organisms. We all live in different parts of the world and get used to our surroundings. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to live in a different part of the world? What would the weather be like? What kind of animals would you see? What are the different kinds of plants that grow there? As we start looking for the answers of these questions, we start learning about the biomes of our planet Earth. Now, let us see what a biome is. The Earth has many different environments. These environments vary in temperature, moisture, light and many other factors. These factors help in forming a habitat. Each of these habitats has a distinct life form living in it. This complex community of plants and animals in a region and a climate is called a biome. The climate and geography of a region determines what type of a biome can exist in that region. The earth includes a huge variety of living things, from complex plants and animals to very simple one-celled organisms. But large or small, simple or complex, no organism lives alone. Each depends in some way or the other on various other living and non-living things in its surroundings for its survival. So it is interesting to know that the biome concept embraces the idea of community. A community where vegetation, animal populations and soil interact with each other as this interaction helps the living organism survive in that particular biome. The world of biome is not only vast, but also interesting. Each one of us should know about the biome, because we ourselves are an integral part of the biome. So, let us enter the fascinating world of biome. Biomes occur naturally, but it will be interesting to know that the people can also create controlled biomes. For example, you can integrate several small populations of various living organisms in a small space and then start observing what happens to them, how they react to their new surroundings and adjust to it. So, once again, if we want to summarize what a biome is, we can say that simply put, a biome is a community of plants and animals living together in a certain kind of climate. As we all living beings form a part of the biome, it is important for us to know what the biome contributes to our survival. The survival and well-being of a biome and its organisms depends on ecological relationships throughout the world. Any changes in part of the world that are far, far away from us not only affect our environment but also us. Even a small change in the atmosphere anywhere in the world can have an impact on our biome. For example, the eruption of a volcano in Mexico can bring the temperature of the whole world down a few degrees for several years. So let's take this adventurous journey of discovery and through the various biomes of our beautiful planet that we call Mother Earth. Can you imagine a planet where 99% of the living space is ocean? You don't have to, you're living on it. That's right, it's our Earth. So let us begin our adventure of biomes from oceans and beaches. 
But before we talk about the oceans, the very first question that arises in our mind is, what's the difference between an ocean and a sea? Technically speaking, all the world's oceans and seas are part of one continuous mass of seawater. But the ocean is so big that we humans have divided it up and given it different names. Until the year 2000, there were only four recognized oceans. But in the spring of 2000, the International Hydrographic Organization marked out a new ocean called the Southern Ocean. So now, there are five main areas in this one big ocean. Seas are usually smaller than oceans and are partially enclosed by land. But otherwise, they're exactly the same thing. Now, we all know that oceans are vast. But do we really have the idea how immense the oceans are? Let us see. Imagine that you're an ant and you're standing on Mount Everest. That's the size of one human being compared to the ocean. Everything about the ocean is immense. It has the tallest mountains in the world and the deepest valleys. It covers 72% of the Earth's surface. That's 139 million square miles. That is 139 with 19 zeros after it. And it's not just wide, it's deep. 12,460 feet deep on average. Let us simplify it more. This is the Empire State Building. Now imagine 10 Empire State Buildings stacked on top of each other. That would be the depth of the ocean. This immense size makes the marine biome the biggest biome of planet Earth. That includes five main oceans. The Pacific, the Atlantic, the Indian, the Arctic and the Southern, as well as many smaller gulfs and bays. The ocean is divided up into three vertical zones. The top layer is called the euphotic zone. It is that area of the ocean where light can penetrate. The next layer is a dysphotic zone. This area is too deep for much light to reach. As a result of this, the lights here look like a twilight on land. The deepest part of the ocean is called the aphotic zone or deep sea. The water here is awfully cold. This deep sea zone is completely dark and low in nutritional content. In the deep sea lives 80% of all the habitats on earth. The deepest point in the ocean, the Mariana Trench, is about 36,200 feet deep. This is much more deeper than Mount Everest is tall. Life underwater is not like a beautiful day at the beach. Most of the ocean is as dark as night. The temperatures are just above freezing point, while in a few places, the temperature is hotter than humans can handle. But that doesn't mean that the ocean is quiet and empty. Yes, oceans are very much alive. Thousands of incredible and bizarre creatures have made it their home. Most scientists think life began in the ocean over three billion years ago. Let us now closely look at the five oceans and discover what it takes for these amazing animals to survive this underwater world. Let us start with the biggest ocean on this planet Earth. Pacific is the largest ocean of all. It has 48% of the world's seawater. This is larger than all the land on this Earth put together. Wow! That is really large, isn't it? The Pacific is also deeper and becomes deeper closer to shore. The Pacific Ocean is spread across 17,700 kilometers in width, that is, 11,000 miles. It includes the Bering Sea, Gulf of Alaska, 
the Philippine Sea and Sea of Japan. It is bisected by the equator. The part north of the equator is called the North Pacific. The part south of the equator, the South Pacific. The interesting thing is that there are more than 30,000 islands in the Pacific Ocean. Most of these islands are the tips of volcanoes that have risen from the ocean floor. In the warm and clear waters of the Pacific coral reefs, develop around the edges of these islands. As the time goes by, the islands slowly sink, but the corals keep growing upwards towards sunlight. A ring of coral is left at the surface where the island was, forming a coral atoll. The Pacific is famous for them. Now, let us see some of the interesting facts that surround the Pacific Ocean. Mauna Kea is a volcano that rises from the Pacific Ocean floor to form the Big Island of Hawaii. Measured from its base, it is 9.6 kilometers tall, which is taller than Mount Everest. Ferdinand Magellan was a famous 16th century around the world explorer. As he traveled the Pacific, he found it peaceful and soothing. So he named the ocean Pacific. The deepest point on the earth is Challenger, deep in the Mariana Trench. It is 11 kilometers deep. Atlantic Ocean. The Atlantic Ocean is the second largest body of water in the world and covers one-fifth of the Earth's surface. If we compare this large ocean with land, then we can say that Atlantic Ocean is about four times the size of North America. It includes the Baltic Sea, Caribbean Sea, Gulf of Mexico and Mediterranean Sea. The Atlantic Ocean sits in an S-shaped basin that runs in a north-south direction, bounded by Europe and Africa on the east and by North and South America on the west. The equator divides the Atlantic into the north and south sections and this ocean stretches from Arctic to Antarctica. The Atlantic Ocean was named after the Greek god Atlas, who held up the heavens. Let us now look at some of the interesting facts about Atlantic Ocean. The Atlantic is getting wider at the rate of about 2.5 centimeters a year. This is about the same rate at which our fingernails grow. When Christopher Columbus made his transatlantic voyage in 1492, the Atlantic was 12 meters narrower, that is, about 40 feet. Indian Ocean. Indian Ocean is the third largest of Earth's ocean. It's bounded on the west by Africa, on the north by Asia, on the east by Australia and the Australasian Islands, and on the south by Antarctica. The Indian Ocean was formed about 125 million years ago when Africa tore free from Antarctica and drifted north. The total area of the Indian Ocean is 73.4 million square kilometers. That's 28.4 million square miles. The ocean narrows towards the north and is divided by the Indian Peninsula into the Bay of Bengal on the east and the Arabian Sea on the west. The Arabian Sea sends two arms northward, the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea. The wonders of the Indian Ocean include coral islands, Antarctic breeding grounds and giant river deltas. The Portuguese explorer Vasco da Gama sailed across the Indian Ocean in 1497 after rounding the southern tip of Africa. Ever since, the Indian Ocean has been a trade route for silks, rugs, tea and spices. The Indian Ocean is very beautiful and popular for tourists. However, the islands of the Indian Ocean are some of the poorest areas in the world. Recently, regulations have been introduced to protect the ecosystem and with it, the fishing stocks. Southern Ocean. The Southern Ocean extends from the coast of Antarctica north to 60 degrees south latitude. The Southern Ocean is now the fourth largest of the world's five oceans after the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean and 
the Indian Ocean, but larger than the Arctic Ocean. It includes the Amundsen Sea, the Belhausen Sea, and the Ross Sea. Arctic Ocean, situated at the top of the world, is the world's smallest ocean called the Arctic Ocean. Arctic Ocean is north of the Arctic Circle and surrounding the North Pole. It includes Baffin Bay, the Hudson Bay, and Greenland Sea. Ice formed by the freezing of sea water covers almost the entire Arctic Ocean in winter. Three forms of ice are found in the Arctic Ocean. Land ice, river ice, and sea ice. Land ice enters the ocean in the form of icebergs. As the fresh water freezes, it is transported into the oceans by the rivers. Sea ice is formed by the freezing of sea water. It is the most extensive form of ice in the Arctic Ocean. Let us now see some of the interesting facts about the Arctic Ocean. Even during summer, half of the Arctic Ocean is covered in sea ice. Most of the ice is three meters thick, that is, 10 feet thick. Every year at the North Pole, six months of darkness is followed by six months of light. In places where the Arctic Ocean is free of ice cover, winter storms cause thorough mixing of shallow waters. The mixing stirs up nutrients, which leads to blooms of phytoplankton growth from spring through to autumn. Water is the common link among all the biomes. Without water, most life forms would be unable to sustain themselves, and the Earth would be a barren, desert-like place. The ocean is home to the smallest plankton and the largest creature on Earth, the blue whale. Come, let us explore the open seas. As we all human beings refresh ourselves every now and then, so does the oceans. Let us see how the oceans refreshes itself. Most of the nutrients of the open sea are in the bottom of the ocean. This is because nutrients are really plant and animals that die and sink. In the open seas, water in the sunlit zone receives lots of sun and has a higher temperature than the water below. Under normal conditions, the process of upwelling brings cooler water from down below towards the top. Cold seawater is rich in nutrients. The supply of nutrient-rich cold water to the sunlit zone is critical in maintaining healthy oceans. Most marine life lives in the sunlit zone, and these creatures need a steady supply of food and nutrients. Upwelling brings nutrients to where they are needed most, at the top of the ocean where most animals live, and thus the ocean gets refreshed. Climate does not have much effect on the marine biome, but the marine biome largely affects our terrestrial climate. Compared to land, oceans warm up and cool down very slowly. As a result, they act as an enormous heat store, able to absorb vast amounts of energy from the sun in warm weather and then release the heat slowly during cold weather. Thus, it affects coastal temperatures. The oceans also provide rain for crops through evaporation and wind to help circulate air. If one day you find the sky sunny and another day you find it cloudy, then it is all because of the influence of the oceans on the weather. So the oceans decide whether it is going to be sunny or a cloudy day. The oceans therefore have a huge influence on the Earth's climate. Let us once again look closely at the layers or the zones of the ocean based on their depths. The top zone is a sunlit zone. In the sunlit zone, the water is very warm because that is where the sun hits. Most of the plants and animals live in the sunlit zone. Here we will find most of the sharks, although there are some sharks that live near the ocean floor also. Beneath the sunlit zone, down to 1,000 meters, or 600 to 3,300 feet, lies the twilight zone. The creatures of the twilight zone are often red or black. The twilight zone temperature can be as low as 41 degrees Fahrenheit. This is because there is less light there than in the sunlit zone. 
Beyond 1,000 meters, that's 3,300 feet deep, is the dark zone, a world of total blackness, except for light made by the animals themselves. In the dark zone, the temperature is about 35 degrees Fahrenheit. There is not much food in this zone. There is another zone below the dark zone, the abyssal zone. In this layer, the mud is made from the skeletons of other small sea animals. The mud can be more than a mile thick. And last come the trenches that are over 19,800 feet deep. The water here is freezing cold and only animals that are adapted to the freezing water can survive in this layer. Temperature is one of the major factors that affects where sea creatures live. Birds and mammals are warm-blooded. They keep their bodies at a constant warm temperature no matter whether the surroundings are warm or cool. Warm-blooded animals such as whales can travel between warm and cold areas and still survive. The grey whale, for instance, spends summers in the chilly waters of the Arctic, but swims to much warmer waters of Baja California in winter. Most sea animals, however, are cold-blooded, which means their body temperature is greatly affected by their surroundings. Such species are less flexible about where they can live. For example, tropical fish would die in cold water and cold water fish cannot survive in tropical water. We all have seen plants on land, but out at sea we can't see any plants at all. This makes us wonder, aren't there any plants in the sea? Of course there are there, but they are microscopic. Most ocean plants are not true plants at all. They are single-celled marine algae. Algae are simple plant-like organisms that lack proper stems, leaves or roots. But these plants are like the true plants on land. They trap sunlight and use it to make food for themselves. Now, let's see how many kinds of plants are there in the oceans. Over one million species of plants and animals have been discovered in the oceans and scientists say there may be as many as nine million species we haven't found yet. One reason the ocean is very important is because of all the algae. Do you know, if it weren't for marine algae, we would not be able to breathe? Yes, it is a fact. Through photosynthesis, marine plants and algae provide much of the world's oxygen supply and take in huge amounts of carbon dioxide. This absorption of carbon dioxide may be a useful tool in reducing the harshness of climate change. One type of marine algae is kelp. Kelp is important because it provides shelter and food for a lot of sea creatures. Kelp is also used by humans for many products, including toothpaste and ice cream. Kelp also serves as a buffer by absorbing energy from waves before the waves hit the shoreline, protecting many of the sandy beaches. Look at these. What are these? Plants or animals? These are plankton. Plankton are tiny open water plants, animals or bacteria. Plankton generally have limited or no swimming ability and are transported through the water by currents and tides. Plankton can be divided into three major size classes. Phytoplankton. Plankton, including algae that can trap sunlight and use it to make food, are called phytoplankton. They are tiny plants that serve as food to many of the ocean's creatures, from the smallest of fish to the largest of whales. Some scientists estimate that phytoplankton provide the earth with almost half of its oxygen. Marine plants live in the euphotic zone or the topmost layer of the ocean because they need energy from the sun for photosynthesis. Zooplankton. These are animal-like plankton that survive by eating phytoplankton. These zooplankton in turn serve as food for large animals such as fish and squid. The smallest phytoplanktons are incredibly tiny. They're so tiny that hundreds would fit on a pinhead. Many of these phytoplankton are not algae, but a kind of bacteria. These are macrozooplankton. They're larger fish eggs and larvae. Cocolithophora is a small but beautiful phytoplankton. They look like a tiny ball covered in round, chalky plates. 
After they die, the shells fall to the seafloor, where they build up and gradually turn into chalk or limestone. Dinoflagellates are also phytoplankton. They have thinner skeletons shaped like leaves or cones, and they produce their own light when the water is disturbed. In some parts of the world, when waves break or when a person swims, the sea surfaces sparkle at night with green light of dinoflagellates. Look at this. Is the water here polluted? Take a closer look. This is not a river of pollution, but a red tide. A mass of tiny dinoflagellates. Under certain conditions, these tiny algae multiply so quickly that they stain the sea and can poison creatures that feed on them. Sometimes phytoplankton grow so quickly and in such huge numbers that they color the water. As they die and become trapped on the surface, they form a scum. This is called a red tide. Despite the name, it can be any color from yellow to blue. Red tides are capable of removing so much oxygen from the water that sea animals suffocate. And some red tides are poisonous. Shellfish, such as clams and oysters, can feed on the poisonous phytoplankton unharmed. But fish or other animals that eat the shellfish may die. Worldwide, red tides caused by a phytoplankton called alexandrium kill nearly 200 people every year this way. We can often find seaweeds attached to rocks in cool shallow water. There are more than 6,000 types of seaweeds. There are three different types, red, green and brown. The biggest seaweeds are of the brown type and are called giant kelps. They're like underwater trees towering up from the seafloor to the surface with fronds as long as 100 meters or 330 feet. The largest giant kelp can grow 30 centimeters or 12 inches a day. The smallest seaweeds, such as the bright green sea lettuce, are paper thin. Large seaweeds have to face a tough time for their survival. Growing in a shallow water, they have to resist the battering of waves and strong currents. They have to stay anchored to stop being swept out to sea. And at the same time, they have to reach toward the surface to trap sunlight. These seaweeds are very useful for us human beings. Raw, cooked or dried, these seaweeds can make a delicious food. They're also rich in vitamins and minerals. Not only this, seaweeds contain chemicals called alginates that are used in the food, medical and cosmetics industries. Alginates form thickeners, binders and stabilizers for all sorts of items like drug capsules, lipsticks, shampoos, toothpaste, low-fat mayonnaise. Sea grasses are the only flowering plants that live underwater in the sea. They're true grasses with proper stems, roots, leaves and flowers. Where they grow well, they form large meadows that support many animals.